Well, thank you for your attendance with us today, and I know we've got a little ways to go, uh, not just through this message, but I understand wonderful lunch and uh, some Q&A that we hope we can serve you in. Um, I'd like to take you now to Philippians chapter 3, if you would. We've looked at the church's unstoppable sovereign and the church unstoppable in suffering. Now we need to come to the core of it, to be honest, and uh, what is it that we are on mission with? What is our message? So if you would uh, take your Bibles and just turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, I'd like to read uh, um, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to focus in on verses 7 to 9 particularly. Remember where Paul is? He's in prison. Remember who the church is that he's writing to? And he says this, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he's got reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Since you decided to attend a seminary on Saturday, hosted by Westminster Theological Seminary, you might know the name of J. Gresham Machen. Machen led the fight against theological liberalism in the first part of the 20th century and was a leader that God used to start our seminary. If you're familiar with him, uh, you have perhaps been exposed to his books or articles where he, that were published on the fight for biblical orthodoxy. What is sometimes less well-known about Machen is it was actually the fight for the gospel Excuse me while I take one of these. <clears throat> it was actually the fight for the gospel in the mission of the church that led to his being thrown out of the PCUSA at that time and the necessi- necessity for him to start the church in which I serve, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. The old denomination had published a book called Rethinking Missions, and the rethink was an attempt to accommodate the modern liberal thought and soften the older reformed and evangelical approach for the gospel mission. The spirit of the rethink was represented in missionaries like Pearl Buck, who, while a missionary in China, wrote things like this about the success of the mission. Here's what Pearl Buck wrote. Let the sole question about that missionary, as she thinks about missionaries, let the sole question about that missionary be whether or not he is beloved in the community whether people see any use in his being among them, whether or not the way he has lived there has conveyed, conveyed anything to the people about Christ, not, mind you, whether he has preached, for that's of no value. And the Christ that Pearl Buck was talking about was not the historic Christ of the Bible, but what the liberals would have called the religious spirit, the personification of men's most beautiful dreams of goodness. The rethought of the missionary message was designed to accommodate modern discoveries that Christ's death was not an atonement for sin, just a moral example. The work of missions was not to convert sinners, but to elevate their social condition as human beings. By the way, that was the beginning of the 20th century. And since all religions find their way to God, all religions should be affirmed and accommodated in the church's missionary message. That was the rethink that was going on in the denomination, amongst other numerous gospel-denying modernist theories. What's sometimes forgotten when people think about the stand Machen and others took in those days is it was actually a stand for the mission of the church. It was not just theological theories. It was because of the way the theology was landing 
in the mission of the church. In our day, there are still trends in teaching in and outside of the church that sow confusion and compromise in the souls and lives of those who need to be reached with the gospel. Let me give you just a couple of examples. For example, the teaching of the insider movement, which encourages Christians in at-risk nations to keep their confession of Christ secret while continuing the practices of their previous religion. Because as one insider advocate put it, no one should consider one's religious form of faith in Christ to be superior to another. Or Bible, translators, Bible translation movements that advocate removing the titles Lord or Son of God to speak of Jesus in context where the lordship and sonship of Christ will not be received as well as diluting in translation other gospel central doctrines and concepts because they'll be found culturally offensive. By the way, I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about the mission field, just in case you're wondering. Or the syncretizing of animism with selected biblical teaching to promote superstitious spiritual warfare practices by missionaries seeking to deliver communities from darkness. Or, for example, the plea that I received from a younger missionary trainee. He was trying to navigate how to deal with missionaries on the field in Africa who were so frustrated with, a little, with little fruit after 40 years of service that their response to this younger missionary was to rethink their Western worldview dominated gospel. And they were going to begin adopting critical justice theories of social and progressive gender and sexuality theories in the name of evangelism. And he contacts me and says, what do I do? Today, as much as ever, if we are to be faithful on our mission from the sovereign Jesus, we must proclaim and protect the gospel message that he has delivered to us. Because our mission is to reach our neighbors and nations with the biblical gospel. Therefore, we need to be reminded what the biblical gospel is. And if we, if we, must, we must be personally committed to it, we must proclaim it, and we must, must protect it. That's why Paul gave them his spiritual autobiography in Philippians chapter 3. In our case study, Acts 16 drew back the curtain on the gospel incursion, and we saw in that case study that the apostles' priority was to do what? Preach the gospel message every time all the time. Now he's going to use the letter that he's writing back to the church to remind them of what that gospel message is. And he does it by means of his autobiography. And he's got a protective pastoral purpose. If your Bible's open, you can notice his protective pastoral purpose. Verse 1, he says this, to write the same things to you, to remind you of them, is what? safe for you. Verse 2, he's like the grandfather that can see the unchained attack dog on the other side of the street and says to his kids, look out, look out, look out. Three times in one verse, look out for the dogs. Then down close to the end of the section, verse 16, he'll close off with, only let us hold true to what we've attained. And then chapter 4, verse 1, that call will come again, stand firm. His pastoral purpose in rehearsing his own experience with the gospel is not to talk about himself but to remind them of the glory of the gospel that he believed, that he preached to them, and that he was now suffering for in an experience they were beginning to share. So as we seek to be faithful to our sovereign's mission, this passage serves to remind us of what we must personally believe, what we must proclaim, and what we must protect on the unstoppable mission, the gospel message. To that end, I'd like you to notice together three glorious gospel realities in Paul's spiritual autobiography. Three glorious gospel realities in Paul's spiritual autobiography. Number one, Christ is of such incomparable worth that we must renounce all our own achievements and assets as rubbish. Christ is of such incomparable worth that we must renounce all our own achievement and assets as rubbish. In the Gospels, Jesus told stories to illustrate the value of who he is and what he did. He said that discovering his kingdom was like a man who discovered a treasure hidden in a field. When he saw it, he covered it up again and went and sold everything else he had so that he could own the field and have a right to the treasure. Jesus followed that story with the famous story of the pearl of great price. A merchant who dealt in fine pearls discovered one of such great value that he went and sold everything else and bought the one pearl. Now, if you're engaged in business at all, you might have made these kind of calculations. You, 
You discover a property. You discover a product, an investment. Your calculations tell you that if it's of greater value, it's of surpassing worth to what you already possess. And so you calculate you should offload your existing assets of lesser value to purchase the property or the product of greater value. Make sense? In this passage, Paul is telling us that when it comes to being right with God, he has discovered the pearl of great price. And that he's done the spiritual calculus, he's done the calculation, and everything he once thought he brought to the table was not just of lesser value, it's actually foul trash. If you look at verse 7 to 8, you can actually hear the crescendo as he makes the calculation. Look at verses 7 to 8, where he says this, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Did you hear it? Because he's seen Christ, he assesses whatever identities and activities he previously thought he added to the religious equation as a loss in terms of the books, spiritually. Now, you have to understand what he's referring to. He's referring to the list that we had up in verses 4 to 6. What he thought were his religious assets and achievements. He had the right pedigree. He came from the right people. He had the right performance under the law under their religious code. He had calculated all of that, his performance, his pedigree, his past. He calculated all of that. He thought that was gain. He thought he brought something to the table in his relationship with God. But since he's seen Christ, he's done the reckoning, and now he considers it all to be lost. But he actually goes further. He says, indeed, now he still counts everything lost. And then he makes it universal. He has suffered the loss, notice, of all things. And then he chooses this very graphic word that goes below loss. He says, rubbish. Now that word in the original context can either mean the scraps of refuse that you throw out the back door to the dog, or it can actually mean excrement. He's picturing offensive, foul waste. So here's what Paul's telling us. Increasingly, continually, he values He values all of his own religious performance, all of his own markers of identity, all of his own accomplishments, all of his own assets, everything and all things that he thought he brought to the table basically as worth filth. A number of years ago, one of my young relatives showed up in my uh, my driveway of my house with a shiny new sports car. He had this shiny new red sports car that was was, uh, was, uh, low-slung, and uh, he had, uh, uh, he pulled it up in the driveway, and he gets out, and he says, hey, come have a look at my new car. You're not going to believe what I paid for this car. It's a, it's, it was a used vehicle. Says, You're not going to believe what I paid for this. So he says, he says, jump in and drive it. And I, I jumped in, and, and, um, and I start to drive it, and I get around the corner, and the wheel started doing this. And we get around another corner, and bang, 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 bang. And I'm going, buddy, how much did you pay for this car? And he realized, okay, he realized, can you hear me? All right. He realized that uh, what he had thought was actually kind of an asset was actually rubbish. That was a gospel reality for Paul. Not just that he discovered that what he thought were flashy assets before God were filth, but that he actually took a good hard look at all of them and he actually considered them. He reckoned them to be filth. But you notice this isn't because he's got a poor self-image. It's not because he's got a dour Scotch disposition that equates misery and religion, no. It's because he's seen something. Rather, he's seen someone of incomparably, incalculably more excellent worth. Chapter 2, he's just reminded them that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, equal in glory with God as God. And as the eternal Son, He willingly came down and took on a human nature as a servant who perfectly obeyed all the will of God for our salvation, so that He obeyed even as far as dying the most offensive, cursed death of a cross. And now He's been raised up, exalted in glory, to the right hand of the Father as Lord over all. And here He's telling us, I've seen Him. I've seen the crucified, exalted Christ Christ. 
the Son of God who came in the flesh to serve my salvation, the one who is now at the right hand of the Father, with all the glory that John describes him with in Revelation chapter 1. And compared to him, everything else is rubbish. All else is rubbish because he glories in Christ Jesus, verse 2, for the sake of Christ. Because Christ is of surpassing, incalculable, excellent worth, all that he once held as his attainments, his identity, everything he thought in life made him something and somebody he now thinks is offensive rubbish in comparison to Christ. Here's what that means for our message on, this, on our mission. Our message must be that those who would gain Christ must renounce their reliance on everything and everything and everyone else for right relationship with God. That relationship with Christ is worth more than everything else you thought that your life, that you thought your identity, and your relationship with God was built on. And that for the sake of Christ, we count everything else we've trusted in and propped ourselves up with as loss. Let me put it another way. Our message must contain the doctrine of repentance. In Acts, Paul actually summarized his message this way. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. His message was testifying both to Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our theological forefathers summarized this part of the biblical message this way in what I think is the finest summary of biblical doctrine in the history of the church, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. Here's what they wrote. Please listen. Maybe you can do a song on this later, Luke. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace wrought in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby out of a sight and sense not only of the danger, but listen, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins. And upon the apprehension of God's mercy in Christ to such as are penitent, so grieves for and hates his sin as he turns from them all to God, purposing and endeavoring constantly to walk with him in all the ways of new obedience. That's repentance, summarized biblically. My friends, glorying in Christ, gaining Christ, means you turn from everything else you've trusted and everything else you've worshipped because he is worth immeasurably more than all of it. That means you can't say you want the biblical Jesus and your previous religion. That means you can't say you want the biblical Jesus and your previous superstition. That means you can't say you want the biblical Jesus and your previous idolatrous worship. It means you can't say you want the biblical Jesus and your previous identity and sin. In order to sense the worth of Christ, we must feel the weight of our sin and the, worth, the worthlessness of our own attempts and assets at righteousness. Christ is of such incomparable worth, we must renounce all our own achievement and assets as rubbish. Second, here's the second glorious gospel reality we find in this passage. Christ is of such incomparable worth that we rely and rest solely on Him for our righteousness from God. Christ is of such incomparable worth that we rely and rest solely on Him for our righteousness from God. One of the great urgencies that should drive our mission is the sure and certain fact that our sovereign will come again in judgment. That's a reality. Jesus Christ now sits at the right hand of God and He will return again and all people will stand before the throne of God to be judged. I remember how God used this in my life over 40 years ago now. I was not raised in a Christian home. My parents and family are all believers now, thanks be to God. But I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And I remember uh, in December in, in Canada, in the back of, a, uh, back of a community hall, with a missionary to Israel presenting on the last times and talking about the return of Jesus Christ and me realizing that if Jesus comes again now, I'm in my sin. And because I'm in my sin, I'm going to hell, and that's God's just judgment. I remember where I was. I can almost tell you what I was, what I was wearing in that moment. 
when the Lord used the reality of the final judgment to bring me to his mercy. Well, here's a missionary from Israel pointing the Gentiles that he's evangelized to the final reality of final judgment, and he reminds them that you can stand before that judgment dressed in one of two kinds of righteousness. Your own self-made righteousness or the righteousness that comes from God. John Murray wrote this, The greatest enemy of the gospel is not human unrighteousness. It's human righteousness. The greatest enemy of the gospel is not human unrighteousness. It's human righteousness. Here's what he means. There's a righteousness that we spend for ourselves, and there's a righteousness that is given by God. Human beings, whether we're religious or secular, perpetually invent their own standards of righteousness and expect that God's going to accept them on, based on that performance. Secular people form their code of righteousness out of being on the right side of the right social cause. You can tell what the standards of righteousness are based on, their, based on the, the creed that they placard on their lawn. Religious people form our sense of righteousness based on our scrupulous observance to our traditions. Not far from where I live in Pennsylvania, you can drive through a community populated with uh, people who depend on their non-use of technology and wearing the same nondescript clothes and cutting their hair in a particular way, thinking that's going to give them right standing with God. Missionaries on the mission field where people depend on their routines at prayer, keeping fasts, keeping festivals, or paying off dead ancestors with money and incense to worshiping and sacrificing to the elements of the earth, secular or religious, pagan or pagan, human beings create their own standards of righteousness by which they leave, live to appease their conscience. And you know why we do it? Because we're made in God's image, and His law is written into our constitution. And instead of submitting to the revelation of His righteousness that He has given to us, we suppress it. And we make up our own standard of righteousness by which we judge ourselves and by which we judge everybody else. And we do it because we're image bearers. And we know God, and we know that He exists, but we don't want to submit to His laws of righteousness, so we create our own laws of righteousness. That's why John Murray said that the greatest enemy of the gospel is not human unrighteousness, it's human righteousness. At the risk of being overbold with new friends, I'm compelled to say that one of the concerns that I have today about teaching that's going on in the church with a message of the so-called social justice message is that it is at best a sub-gospel. Wherever social justice teaching gives us a rethink of what the gospel is and it preaches that the gospel is what we do right, even where it illuminates us to, to good works the Bible might have prescribed for us that we have missed, Whenever a teaching puts your acceptance with God or your acceptance with the church based on what you do, that's forming a, uh, that's forming a suit of human righteousness. And when Paul looks at the day when he'll stand at the foot of God's judgment seat, he doesn't want to be found dressed in his own filthy homespun suit. He wants to be dressed in Jesus' robes. He's renounced everything else so that he may on that day be found, notice what he says, in him. When God examines the heart and exposes the life of everyone from every tribe and every nation on that day, he wants to be found in Christ. By God's grace to be credited, to be counted, to be clothed in Jesus' impeccable obedience to every jot and tittle of God's law. When I was a young Christian, somebody gave me a parable to help me understand what Jesus had done for me. The parable went like this. There was an ancient tribe that had a chief that was known both for his justice and for his mercy. And in that particular tribe, there was a law that said, if you steal, you get flogged. And that flogging could take the lives of young, healthy people. And the tribe discovered that they had a thief in their midst, so they set a trap for the thief. And they found the thief, and they went to the judge who was known for his justice and his mercy and told them to come to his judgment seat, and they would bring the thief before him. As he went to his judgment seat and the crowd parted and the thief was brought before him, he discovered he was looking into the eyes of his aged mother. And the crowd began to murmur. And the crowd began to say, well, now what's he going to do? Because if he's just, he's got to send her the, to the flogging post, but she'll die. If he's merciful, then he can't be just. And so the judge stood up and said, take her to the flogging post. 
He stood up and took her to the, he said, take her to the flogging post. And the crowd began to murmur, well, he's just, yeah, but he's not very merciful. And so they took her to the flogging post, and they tied her to the flogging post, and they began to bear her back so that they could bring the lash down on her back. And the, judge, and the chief said, stop. And people began to say, oh, you see, he's merciful. Yeah, but he's not very just. And the chief went over, and with his own robes on, he put his, put his arms around his mother, bent over her back, and looked at the man and said, proceed, bringing together both his justice and his mercy. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul sums up the breathtaking gospel this way. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the reality behind what Paul is saying in our passage. Listen, Jesus Christ is God's righteousness revealed. He is the one and only man who sinlessly loved and lived the, and was obedient to God's revealed will and law. Jesus is the righteousness, the righteous one. And his obedience went all the way to obeying God's command to give himself up on the cross for sinners. Where in the great substitution, he was legally counted and credited the sin, the unrighteousness of all those who would believe in him. And God poured out his wrath on him for their unrighteousness. But not only that, in the great exchange, God legally counted, listen, legally counted and credited Christ's righteousness to all those who would believe in him so that the righteousness of Christ is now theirs legally, irrevocably, eternally. The breathtaking gospel exchange is that the legal imputation of our unrighteousness to Christ and his righteousness to us doesn't happen by our law-keeping. Our laws, the culture's co cultural code, even the law of God the exchange takes place by Him, by grace, through faith in Christ alone, giving us the righteousness of Christ. And it's on His righteousness that we are accepted, that we are acquitted for all eternity. It's not by our working, but by our believing in His work. If I could refer to them again, here is how the godliest and most gifted of our theological forebears summarize this. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein He pardoneth all our sins, past, present, future, and accepts us as righteous in His sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Here's what Paul's saying in Philippians 3.20. That's how he wants to stand before the judgment seat of God. That's how he wants to be found dressed in the righteousness of Christ alone. And that gospel reality is inextricably bound up from the message that we are to steward on Christ's mission. Third, Christ is of such incomparable worth that we rely on the power of His resurrection to become increasingly like Him. Christ is of such incomparable worth that we rely on the power of his resurrection to become increasingly like him. If your Bible's still open, would you just look back again with me? I'd like to read just verse 10, uh, just verse 10 and on for you. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Sometimes people either amongst our neighbors or the nations hear the good news that equivalent acceptance before God is based not on their keeping of God's law or even man's law, and their reflex is then this, well, therefore the law of God and the commands of God have no relevance or rule over my life in Christ. I can do what I want. Because I'm righteous in Christ, I do not need to feel concerned to live righteously. Well, seasoned gospel missionary and pastor that Paul was, he anticipated that distortion of the gospel message. In the book of Romans, he wrote this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? You know the answer to his, to his question, Romans 6, 1 and 2, By no means. And then he goes on to say that because we are in Christ, we have died to sin, and in our inner man we've been raised to walk in newness of life with Christ. 
being united to the Christ who justifies us by his righteousness alone means we're united in Christ to his death, to sin, and resurrection, to new life, and righteous living. Paul makes that point doctrinally in Romans 6. Now he's making it biographically in Philippians 3, 10 to 14. Remember, you, perhaps you remember those famous verses over in chapter 12, where he, uh, chapter 2, where he says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out, not work for, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for... It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here's the point Paul's making biographically in chapter 3. Assured that he has been justified by Christ and will be found in Christ. Notice what he says in 3.10. And now I want to know him increasingly, personally, experientially, relationally. I want to know Jesus. And knowing Jesus has boots on the ground expression in daily life. In chapter 3, verse 10, he gives us three of them. One, it means knowing the power of his resurrection. Two, it means sharing in his suffering. We just looked at that. Three, even becoming like him in his death. Please don't miss the order. We expect the order to be suffering, death, and then resurrection from the dead, right? And in verse 11, he points us to that final hope. But in verse 10, he starts the chain with the resurrection. Knowing the power of his resurrection, the logic is this. Listen. Knowing the power of Christ's resurrection leads to the likeness of Christ in those other expressions. Why does he go in that order? Because it's the resurrection power of Christ working in us by the Spirit that empowers us to become like Him in cross-shaped living, that empowers us to become like Him in obedience, even all the way to death, in all other ways. Paul's sure and certain final hope at the end of life is the resurrection of the body from the dead. His first thought and confidence for this life is knowing the power of the resurrected Christ in his own heart, his own life, to make him more like Christ. So that as he knows him, he more and more puts off sin, both what he feels, what he thinks, what he says, what he does, his affections, his thoughts, his speech, his behavior, more and more like Christ as Christ powerfully works in him to conform him to his image. Progressive, though not yet perfected conformity to the character of Christ according to the commands of God. It's not that he's trying to earn his way to the resurrection by now obeying good works. He's not suddenly become confused between what he said in the first part of the passage in verses 10 and 12, but it's precisely the assurance of Christ for him, the assurance of Christ in him that causes him to pursue conformity to Christ, not as merit, but as a manifestation of the salvation he has in Christ. Let me tell you the difference this makes in your life. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of pastoring in a church where there was a young man who uh, looked like a Christian, talked like a Christian, came from a great Christian background, even smelled like a Christian. And one evening, a, a loving relative brought him to me as the pastor, and he said, Pastor, so-and-so has something he needs to tell you. Well, the young man couldn't talk. What became apparent was he had just been exposed and caught up in a lifelong dominating sin that young men get themselves caught up in. And now he was ashamed, locked up, and couldn't even begin to talk. I gave him the Bible. He couldn't even tell me what he'd done. I gave him, I gave him the Scriptures, turned to Psalm 51. I said, why, why don't you just read that? Just read that to me, Psalm 51. God, be merciful to me. And he began to read, and he began to weep, and he began to confess as the Scriptures opened up his heart to expose his sin in, in the front of the mercy of God. And as the weeks went by, as the weeks went by, we began to meet for discipleship and counseling. And finally, I got him to that passage in Romans chapter 6 that I read to you, that we have died with Christ and been raised with Christ so that we can offer ourselves as slaves of righteousness. And his face physically came up from the pages of Scripture, and he said to me, you mean I don't need to be this the rest of my life? I said, no, you don't need to be this the rest of your life. And I'm convinced that that's when he came to faith in Christ. And if I could tell you the story and tell you who he was, the transformation of that young man's life, it's absolutely God glorifying it. Here's the glorious gospel reality that we need to retain and protect and promote as part of our message. The gospel is not only Christ for us. 
It's Christ in us, conforming us to the image of Christ all the way from the heart to the head to the hands to the life. The gospel message and being faithful on Christ's unstoppable mission means that we have to be faithful to the whole gospel of the whole Christ as we seek to take that gospel to the whole world. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we not only have a glorious gospel written on the pages of Scripture, but it, it reveals what that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came and died and prayed and reigns and now by the Spirit rules in the hearts of his people. So Lord, as we sat under this teaching today, would you please tear down every stronghold that raises itself up against the knowledge of Christ, even in the lives of your people. Lord, we would pray that if there be one person who, while they have, while they have been part of a church and church circles, if there be one person who as yet has not personally believed this gospel, would you give the grace of salvation? Then, Lord, would you make us passionate to proclaim it? Would you make us faithful to protect it? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.